Llewellyn King, the host of NECFS Alert. Today we're going across to Hawaii to have a conversation with Jan Montgomery, who has long experience, good and bad, in dealing with ME, CFS, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, or more commonly called by many people chronic fatigue syndrome. Jan, work, welcome to the broadcast. Tell me your story and your involvement with this terrible disease. Okay, thank you for having me, Llewellyn. I followed you for years. Um, I have been sick with chronic fatigue syndrome since 1988. Now the issue for me is that I lived in San Francisco and it was in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. So we started to think it was a retrovirus because we all knew we were sick and we were sick just like the people who had AIDS, but the test hadn't come out yet. Our symptoms were exactly the same as the people they called AIDS-related complex back then, and they called them the word well because they didn't believe they had AIDS until they had Carposis or pneumocystis or whatever. So Jay Levy and the head of Health for California, um, San Francisco Public Health Department put on the first major conference for chronic fatigue syndrome in 1989. Um, because at that time, uh, we believed that this was viral. Jay Levy believed it, and George Rutherford believed it, the head of the state public health department, and our public health department believed it. And so um, what was so amazing about it, and we have it on video on a film called Living Hell, and I have the original, um, what you see is these people talked about Epstein-Barr and talked about different viruses, and you know, it, it was it was shocking to see then that it took 30 years. And so that 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 video really showed is a great video and it really shows that we knew a lot of this 30 years ago. And you know, I fought for NH money for years and years and years. I was I was on the Surgeon General's committee. I was um, in San Francisco, I was part of a big health network. I mean, everybody believed our disease. Then we started a fatigue clinic at the University of, um, at UCSF, and the fatigue clinic, it, which nobody did. I mean, fatigue was just this thing. And we all knew that fatigue was a major part of many, many diseases, that there are two kinds of fatigue. There's regular fatigue, and then there's disorder or disease fatigue, right? We knew that. We knew that from HIV. So we moved along and we're so excited. And then uh, Stephen Strauss started putting out evidence, not evidence, but opinion, that it was all psychological. And, the, um, and put it in a little office called the Women's Institute. The Women's, there's not an institute, there's like a little office of women's services. And that's where they put. This was, uh, um, um, and this was in San Francisco? No. Um, you mean what after happened, NIH? After the Tahoe episode, when the CDC went back and said, named it chronic fatigue syndrome. This was after Incline Village in 84. Right, right. And right. so this, this is in, in the film, several people talking about Alzheimer's. Nancy Klimas is in the film, Jay Levy's in the film. Um, and it really shows that the big thing is, if we had started doing research on my disease 25 years ago, we wouldn't be in COVID. And uh, you came down in 88. Now you ran or were very instrumental in the Civics Association in San Francisco, which I think is disbanded now. In fact, as yeah. far as I know, the only real Civics Association still operating under a different name is in Massachusetts, which I think mm -hmm. is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they've always been good. Massachusetts has always been good. Oh, they're we, phenomenal. Pardon? They are phenomenal. They yeah. Really are very gifted people who work very hard. So, Saul Demi comes from the original Syphids Association in North Carolina. A man named Mark Iverson ran it. Then 
about a year later, there was the San Francisco Sifids Foundation. And the two organizations worked together to form the initial fight against chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, we were lucky because Mari and I had been social activists for a long time. We have a lot of contacts in, in San Francisco. So we were able to build this, this unique place. And uh, Mark helped and we, we set up a hotline. We actually had a hotline. I mean, I haven't been able to reach anybody at Solve ME or ME Action because it's too hard to get to the director or the, you know. And, and I tend to think that um, real social movements stand on the shoulders of their founders. And so I'm a little insulted that that hasn't happened because a story is really important. So we started the um, hotline and we um, ran it for about five years and we made a lot of progress, but the whole time, Steven Strauss kept putting this out and finally I think Jay just said, you know, he was investigating um, viruses and in, in, in cancer. And he's a good friend of mine. We became very good friends over the years. Um, but he said, I just, you know, there's no money. There's no money to do anything for it. So uh, then, of course, it started being called Duffy Flu and everything else, and nobody wanted to work on it. You know that, Luella. Nobody would work on it because they were told that um, it wasn't real. And now we realize it wasn't just women, because it was women, because NIH has no women and never has really. I mean, they started using female mice in the 90s, in the 80s. Stephen's just at putting this out, Tony Fauci or somebody, and I don't want to pick on Tony right now because I know it's a hard time, but started spreading rumors that the scientists were all getting calls from these crazy people. And uh, of course, there were crazy people because and, they were and, all and very angry people. And very angry. And you know, I tell this story about Winnie Mandela, who was a fabulous social justice person and helped the community and everything. And after 30 years of being tortured, she finally got crazy and never was herself again, became a kind of criminal and everything else. And I think when you're under that kind of stress for 30 years, it's really easy to just lose it, you know, lose all faith, all spirit, everything. Um, and so, you know, it really, really upsets me that we had the handle on Epstein-Barr. Almost everybody believed it was Epstein-Barr and then it just went away, just went away. So we got kicked out of the neurology department at UCSF. Um, and we, I stopped doing the, we closed down in maybe 1996. And we had received money from foundations. I mean, so uh, we shut down and then I actually took an antiviral and my fatigue went away, like a click. My fatigue went away. And now in retrospect, I think that anti viral might have hit the Epstein-Barr virus because like magic, my fatigue went away. Do you recall and what antiviral it was? Amantadine, which is interesting because I have a lot of neurological symptoms and amantadine is an old flu drug that's also used for Parkinson's. So um, it, it helped me, I mean, really Llewellyn, it was like a click. But it doesn't help on everybody. I've had other people try it. Well, it that's the story with Amplogen too. It doesn't work on everybody, but it right. does work for some people. And I know people who say they would have lost all mobility without Amplogen. And of course, yeah. it's very, very hard to get. Yeah, well, Amplogen is in, in, the, um, in the film too. People who were on allergy is in the film too. Mm -hmm. So we, we have the history. I would just kind of like to get it out there a little more because it's a, for disability activists, it's been a long haul, right? Tell me what, what was your career before you came down with uh, myalgia? I was a vice office. president, I was a vice president at a major bank. 
Um, and uh, I just, I had to go out on disability when I was 38. Wow. And have been there since. And I'm one of the really lucky ones. I mean, I've been bed bound for weeks and months uh, during that time. And I have go in and out of a wheelchair. Um, my cognitive stuff, I feel, is, is going. But, you know, what I think is neuroinflammation is changing everything. Everything. I just that sad it came so late. Um, for, for many, have you, many have you tried the, the antiviral drug again or subsequently? I'm starting to try antiviral drugs that are similar to amantadine to see, but, but the herpes thing is probably what's still with me. Okay. okay. So, I mean, I, I'm diagnosing myself, but you know, Lou Ellen. <laughs> so well, you, I, know, you know, there is this tendency in medicine for silently to wish the, the patient to have the, the symptoms or the, the infection that the uh -huh. doctor knows how to treat, not to yeah. find out what's actually wrong with the patient. There's been a lot of that. In, yeah. in me, a great deal yeah. of it. Uh, and of course, it's yeah. very hard to find a doctor. One of the problems is I get telephone calls, and other people I know who are active get telephone calls, sad, sad calls. Where can I find a doctor? And I have no idea. Because no. in some states, no. South Dakota is one, there are no yeah. doctors whatsoever, no clinicians. No. The no. other thing that we see that seems to be disturbing, but that I know is that the number of clinicians uh, doesn't seem to be increasing and they seem to be getting older. The number of researchers, that's not true. Research is more alive than actual patient care. There's very few places for patients and it must be really terrible at the present time where the isolation is compounded by the national need to be isolated. Absolutely, absolutely. Everybody with chronic disease is, is at really severe risk, I think, during this. And, um, you know, but I, I think we have hope, Lou Ellen, because I really believe with the COVID virus, we're going to start to understand that brains, viruses and toxins are in the brain. And the reason I got interested during my 10-year remission I started to study neuroinflammatory diseases, not just CFS, but fibro and Gulf Did War. The, the remission followed your treatment with the antiviral. Yeah, right. And so you and had, had, had 10, 10 functional years. And then without fatigue. Oh, and I fantastic. still don't have fatigue. Okay, but, so, but you have the other symptoms. I have a very neurological cognitive disease now. But I have to say, I'm really lucky, Llewellyn. I mean, most people don't live to my age, and at this age, they're suffering so much they can't function at all. And you know, I've been I've been resilient for some reason, and so I believe I can come back again because I think COVID and CFS are are very similar in some ways, and everybody in the world is working on an antiviral drug right now, right? Everyone in the world. I think you're right in that there will be a lot more attention paid to all kinds of viral infections, whether whether it will extend, I hope, to, to ME, I'm not sure. But uh, the herpes relationship does seem to be, the same. I'm not a doctor, of course, I'm a journalist, but there yeah. does seem to be some relationship there that, uh, that who knows. A little while back you mentioned, and my, the producer, my wife, Linda, has just passed me a note which says, we should clarify the names. Who is Jay, Mark, Stephen, and Maria? Okay, okay. Mark Iverson was the founder of really the first national CIFITS organization at the, yeah, in North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. And he was a visionary and very, he was a former something, I don't know, but he was a really lovely guy. And uh, he led the CIFITS movement throughout the 90s or up until 95 or something. And I, I don't know where he is. Um, but uh, we, okay, Mark, Jay Levy is the head of the Cancer Institute at 
the University of California in San Francisco. And he was with us in the early days and really believed this was either a virus or an autoimmune disease. And that's in the movie too. He's quoted, he's there and he says it. Um, George mm -hmm. decided that this was just women complaining. But you know, I've realized something else, Llewellyn, and that's that the other reason that docs don't want to take it on is it's extremely complicated. It may be one of the most complicated diseases. Well, certainly, certainly the, the any kind of diagnosis is hugely complicated. Uh, right. and it cannot be done in the seven to nine minutes allocated by a general practitioner. Therefore, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, basically the waste barker waste basket analysis doesn't work because it can't be done there's no time yeah. for it the economics of medicine have become so uh, rigorous yeah yeah i have i actually now have three doctors and one is a rheumatologist one is a uh internist and one is a, a neurologist and i have had to work with them from the beginning to have them believe in my disease but i've worked with them and worked with them and you know now the low blood stuff uh and they're I, i'm telling them you know you're gonna see a lot of these people with covid and you know this is this is big and they're finally starting to get it i think but you know i've <laughs> how many doctors waiting rooms have i been in for 30 years <laughs> Um, that is the story. To get the initial diagnosis, my unscientific count is it's, it's just it's impossible. About 12 people. And mm -hmm. usually you have to diagnose yourself or know someone. And sometimes that's very dangerous. And I know, it's horrible. Thing to do. Uh, how did you come to go from San Francisco to Hawaii? Well, um, about 20 years ago, I just was so sick. I couldn't stay in the Bay Area. The, the air, car exhaust, anything made me go to bed. So we came here, rented a house with a bunch of other people, and we did it for a couple of years, and I was definitely better here. Uh, later on, I got bad again, but not as bad, because, you know, we have the freshest air in the world here, right? We're right smack dab in the middle of the ocean. So it makes, and, and we have windows and doors open all the time, so it makes a giant difference. But, you know, I have to say, well, one of the things that has kept me alive, because, I, of course, like everybody, I've had despair, but one of the things that keeps me alive is the fact that I know there are so many people out there who have been so shamed and so broken and, you know, I just want them to feel like we got here. But, you know, it's, it's really hard to have hope. One of the great messages that we can all sing is that you are not alone. Now, I have to say, I'm very privileged. That's the big, big word right now. But, you know, I had enough money because my partner bought a house in 1974 in San Francisco for $28,000 or something. And we lived there for 25 years. So I have enough money. Um, and I have a partner who has been with me the whole time, the whole time. So, you know, in those ways, I've just always been so privileged as a person with sickness. I mean, you know, I know people alone who just can't function. Maybe you would so, share with us in closing how your day goes and how hmm. ME impacts that day, day in and day out. Okay, so I'm couch bound or bed bound, which we see in the low blood flow, finally explains why we're bed, bedridden. Um, I have a lot of muscle pain on a regular basis, but right now I can't know if I'm gonna walk or not walk if I get out of bed. And, and what happens is I get these giant tremors. So it's not like I could fall. <laughs> It's like my legs just go completely out, so I can't even get to the bathroom. Now, the next day, maybe I can walk a little bit with a walker. So I think a lot of people would tell you every day for me is really different. I still have good days, 
Do you, do you find anything you're particularly allergic to? And I'm thinking about mold at the moment. But it's interesting. Things. Before my remission, I was allergic to everything. I, was allergic, I, I couldn't walk in the hardware store because of the pesticide. I couldn't walk in a rug store because of the chemicals. So I was really, really sensitive. And then the uh, amantadine just took it away. I'm not. I mean, I can smell mold, but it doesn't. How, how and why did you stop the antiviral if it was so? I'm still, I'm still on it. And I think it's still working on my fatigue because really I have, I have like normal fatigue, which is a miracle. I've got 10 years. It's a miracle because most it's patients from I know, if they do anything, like go out to dinner, let's say, or visit, yeah. they in bed yeah. for two days. And that's those that are fairly functional, not those yeah. that are bed bound yeah. continuously. Right. Right. Yeah. It's hard for people to believe that one drug could do that. But, and all my doctors say, yeah, 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 yeah. But we know how sensitive this disease is, you know? I mean, we know that things work that never worked on anything else. So, um, for years I studied anti-inflammatory diseases, and that's the level I, I want to stay on, because I believe MCSF is one or maybe the major, maybe the major, but it's not the big picture. The big picture is neuroinflammatory diseases in general. We have to we have to fight for those. We're a new category of illness called neuroimmune disease. <laughs> Jan, it's a great privilege to talk to you. You're very inspiring you. and very interesting. And I thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you. Can I say one last thing? Absolutely. I, you know, I never realized that I've been a dis disability activist for 30 years. Because with chronic disease, we don't tend to talk about disability. You know, you're disabled if you're in a wheel wheelchair, right? And so I've started calling myself a disability activist because you know what, that's what I am. <laughs> and it's much more credible if you say to people, well, I'm a disability activist, and everybody who works on this disease is a disability activist. That's very interesting. With that, Thank aloha. <laughs> aloha. Thank you so much. All the very best to you. Cheers. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.